If you're a, a land-owning farmer, you have to have a sword or an axe. You have to have armor, you have to have a, a helmet, you have to have a crossbow. The sword was a very common part of medieval life. It's a violent time and you need to be able to defend yourself. One of the things that is really interesting is that we carry such a strong image of the sword, which is very different from what the sword actually was. I am Peter Johnson. I am a swordsmith. I've been working as a swordsmith since around 20 years. I make uh, reconstructions of medieval swords based on study of originals in museums around Europe. In popular ideas that the sword is exclusively something that belongs to the nobility, the knightly class. The sword was much more widely dispersed in society. You had to have a certain level of income and means to be able to own a sword, but it's not a unique object. And I like to compare it to owning a car. You can't take it for granted that you own a car, but it's still pretty common. There's a market for used cars, just like there was a market for used swords. Swords were mass produced, but you also have unique individual swords made for the very, very top of, of society. If we look at the sword from the Viking period into the high Middle Ages, it's gone through a development that is already several thousand years old. But this is a time of change in metallurgy, in craft tradition, in economy, in national trade, in faith and religion, and all of these things have a great effect on the actual design of the sword. This is a selection of swords that spanned the time period from around 850 AD to around 1450 AD. This was the favorite weapon of the Norse warriors based on the Roman Spatha, but evolved into a much heavier and sturdy weapon of war. From being a single-handed weapon, swords started to be wielded with two hands, really wide, cutting-oriented swords, cruciform, knightly sword. This one in particular is based on an original that is in the British Museum. It's unusual in that it has twin fullers. The fuller is to remove material while maintaining stiffness. By the middle of the 14th century and into the 15th century, you have this type of long sword. This is a primarily a thrusting weapon. It was favored in a time when the armor is really complete. You have mail, you have padding, and quite a bit of plate. And if you're going to make any kind of impression on a man in that kind of armor, you need to be using the point. So the difference between the mass-produced swords and those that were made for kings and princes is mostly in the time invested in their making and the material used. So a very simple mass-produced sword, they are supremely purposeful. They are not any worse in balance than the best swords. Maybe there are there's gold and, and silver being used on the very fine swords. Maybe you have inlay or there is decoration and rich materials in the grip and the scabbard that makes it into an obvious luxury item. But the sword inside could be very similar to the very simple mass-produced item. The manufacture of swords was divided between specialist craftsmen. The swordsmith, as we think of it today, is most probably the bladesmith, which means he is a specialist who only makes sword blades. The blacksmith will not forge weapons. They will make nails and horseshoes and hinges and stuff like that. The bladesmith makes only swords. There's a specialist grinder. You have another craftsman making the guard and the pommel, and yet a craftsman making the scabbard. Perhaps a specialist belt maker and someone who makes the belt buckle, and finally, there is the sword cutler, who is the, let's say, entrepreneur, the person who has the customer contact. So the mark on the blade in medieval swords is not the mark of the smith, it is typically the quality test mark of the place where the sword is sold. Really a kind of a cottage industry mass production. An army sword of that time would take about a week to make. The simple sword of a crusader or a mercenary. But if you're talking about the sword for a prince or a very highly placed individual, it can be months of work. The status of the smith is also a really interesting question because they could be war booty. The smith 
could be some things you owned in the high medieval period. You have craftsmen organizing in guilds in towns. In such a situation, the master craftsmen were, of course, really important citizens, employing many people around him. And then you have specialist artisan craftsmen who are employed directly by a prince or a bishop to make weapons for their household. So it really runs the, the, the whole gamut of being a nobody, not even a person, to being a very elevated person in society. The classic European knightly sword is a double-edged weapon. In fighting, you use both edges. You can do like a backhand or twisted cut. A sword of this type is perhaps surprisingly light. It's an agile and again, purposeful feeling in your hand. Balance point, vibration nodes and pivot points together make up three aspects of the dynamic properties of a sword. The point of balance in an unmounted sword can be expected to be roughly two-fifths of the total length. With the balance point, we can also look at the vibration nodes. So what's a vibration node? Well, it's actually a place where the vibrations in a blade is cancelled out. And there is a second point of no vibration further down on the blade. So we can call this the hilt node and the blade node. The blade is a fairly flexible thing. It will, it will flex and vibrate, but in these points, it tends to be stiff. And that's important uh, both in, in handling and in cutting. The third aspect of the dynamic properties is the pivot points. At the front end of the hilt, if I grasp this like this and move the sword rapidly back and forth. There is a place where the blade pivots. Pivot points will have to do with how the sword will naturally want to move. This is really important in fencing, but it's also something that acts to dampen a recoil. Once you mount the hilt, there will be a, a drastic change. The point of balance has moved considerably closer to the hilt. The art is really to have a a smooth and agile sword with a balance point as far away from the hilt as possible. You want to have a blade that leads, that gives you a clear direction, but it shouldn't be on the expense of making the sword cumbersome or clumsy. This area of the sword, the hilt, corresponds to the outer half of the blade. If you strike the sword here, there will be a no recoil point in the middle of the hilt. The same is true, of course, in the hilt. So outside the node, the sword will wobble, but in the node, the sword is stiff. And this has a direct effect on how efficient the sword is in cutting. This is really a well thought out weapon for its time. Every sword is really a compromise. It needs to be flexible, so it can take up the, the impact stresses on the blow, but it shouldn't be too flexible, otherwise it won't be able to deliver a blow. That's where the real art of making a sword is, the fine adjustment to find the sort of the best combination of opposing qualities. This is of course using our contemporary concepts for describing this. However, when you study historical swords, you can see that whatever concept, whatever ideas, whatever methods they had, it resulted in swords with very specific properties. You can recognize a long, slim thrusting sword, and it will have a different set of dynamic properties than a wide cutting sword. A sword from the Viking period will typically have a different set of dynamic properties if you compare it to a high medieval cruciform sword. Even if they had different concepts and different words to describe this, they had a very clear idea of what a sword needs to be to perform properly. If you look at manufacture, if you look at price, if you look at how common it was, how it was used, just about any aspect of the sword, when you actually look at it and study it, you will be surprised because it's not really what you might think it was. I like to liken the sword to a key. It's a key that fits a very special lock. And when we open that lock, we see history 
in a completely new way.